Namaste. So today I want to talk about a subject that's really very dear to my heart. And that is the land of no sorrows. Where is that land? It's within us. Like Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is within you. But we're not talking about heaven. We're talking about something even beyond heaven. Something, a, a place, a state of being actually, where there is not only is no sorrow, there can be no sorrows. And that is, of course, when one realizes Brahman. So I'm going to start with our good old chart showing the Chatur Darshan of the four views. And if you follow this channel, you've seen this chart many times before. But do you really understand it? I tell you what, stop the video, pause the video, and take a screenshot of this. And study it and come to understand it because we use this as the framework, as the ontology behind all of our work. So unless you understand the terminology, unless you understand the meaning, you won't really be able to get what we're talking about here. Now, in the beginning of Dvaita Vada, one performs karma yoga. Karma yoga means ritualistic religious practices. And in those practices, one worships God in some form and does different rituals like arati or uh, deity worship or homa or many, many other different things, mantras of all kinds. Anyway, the point is one does this because of the rules, because of following a guru, because of following the Vedas or whatever scripture you happen to follow. Now this is karma yoga. Why is it karma yoga? Because the purpose is to build up enough pious karma to reach the stage of love of God. When love of God blossoms spontaneously in the heart, that's the beginning of bhakti yoga. Now let's be really clear on the distinction. In bhakti yoga, one may perform exactly the same activities. But instead of doing it because it's written in the book or because the guru has given some rules and regulations, one does it spontaneously out of love. That's the difference. In karma yoga, it's a duty. In bhakti yoga, it's a pleasure. It comes out of love. And this ultimately leads to what's called bhakti rasa. Bhakti rasa is a very elaborate subject matter. But basically, there are five types of relationships with God. Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. And the order is important because as far as the intensity of the relationship goes, as far as the level of ecstasy achievable through it, as far as the level of self-realization that one can achieve through it, these five different types of relationship with God are in the order of intensity, of increasing intensity and bliss. Neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. But what does neutrality look like? In neutrality, one thinks, oh, God is great. Huh? but far away. And I have no personal relationship, really. I just, I just love the greatness of God. 
and the wonder of God's power and so on like that. And this is really uh, where most karma yogis are at. As soon as one graduates to bhakti yoga, then there's a more intimate relationship. And in the beginning, this is servitorship. I'm serving God. I'm doing things to make God happy. I'm offering things to God. I'm praising God in different ways. I'm studying the scriptures given by the God and so on, or about the God. So this is servitorship. And one feels that God is great and I am small, but I have a relationship. I am a servant. For example, in the pastimes of Ramachandra, Rama had many servants and the chief among them was Hanuman. Hanuman was a great devotee, or is a great devotee of Ram, and he has astounding mystical powers. He's almost like a god himself, but he doesn't take any credit for these. He gives all the credit to Ram. But when Rama was building the bridge from India to Sri Lanka, then Hanuman was bringing whole mountains and throwing them in the water. And there was also one spider who was taking one grain of sand at a time and throwing. So Hanuman was saying, spider, get out of the way. I have to bring these mountains here. Huh? Maybe you get crushed. Get out of the way. And Ram said, no, no. He is doing to his capacity. You are doing to your capacity. So all the devotees, all the servants serve according to their capacity. And they serve what? The purpose. Now, when one becomes adept in serving the purpose of God, then one is known as a friend of God. These are the preachers, the teachers, the great religious leaders huh, that explain and codify in religious works of, of literature and so on, the actual a proper relationship between ourselves and God. So this is acting as a friend of God. Why? Because one is trying to forward the purpose of God in this world, which is to bring all the beings to self-realization. So it gets better. <laughs> one can become the parent of God. This kind of a relationship is when one is responsible for taking care of God. For example, someone who manages a great temple. There may be many devotees engaged in service in the temple, and there may be many deities in the temple, and all of them have to be served in the right way, the appropriate way to please them. So the responsibility with all of this lies with the manager of the temple, the, the, or the guru of the temple, or whoever is in charge. That person has to make sure, just like a parent taking care of a child, has to make sure that all the child's necessities are taken care of. In the same way, the temple managers are like the parents of the deities in the temple. And they perform many, many services day and night. They live for the service of the deity. It's not something that they do apart from their ordinary life. It is their ordinary life. <laughs> this level of dedication is very rare. We don't see often uh, people on this level. But even more rare than that is the stage of conjugal love. In conjugal love, one becomes the lover of God. And I mean in the exact same sense as one has a lover in this material world. One becomes related to God in that mood. Huh? These are all moods. These are all emotions. These are all transcendental desires. And one is relating to a certain form of God in each of these five relationships. Whether neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, or conjugal love, one has a certain form of God, and this is called Ishta Devata. 
Ishta Devata means the primary deity that one serves. So all of these relationships are centered around a particular form of God, a particular deity with a particular name and particular pastimes as well. It can be very, very specialized. Actually it has to be to uh, express our inner desire towards God as a unique individual. Every creation of God is unique and personal and individual. There are no two people alike in this world or any world. <laughs> and so one has to find one's Ishta Devata. And I had, I had this issue come up around the year 2000, 2001, 2002, something like that. And I went to a respected sannyasi that I knew in India, in Vrindavan. And I asked him, how does one confirm, how does one know one's Ishta Devata? So he said, well, the sadhus chant the Kama Gayatri Mantra. The Kama Gayatri Mantra is a very important mantra. It's a Gayatri, meaning it has a 24 syllables. But it's about Kama. Kama means desire, and specifically conjugal desire, but it can be any desire. So one finds the, the specific form of God to which one is related by chanting and meditating on this mantra. And then this is something that I'm not going to make known publicly. If you research it, you can find it. But really the best thing is to be initiated by your guru. Uh, so if you have a guru, ask your guru to initiate you into Kama Gayatri Mantra so that you can find your Ishta Devata. So it's always surprising. I don't know anybody who has actually done this who was not completely surprised by their experience. <laughs> because it's one thing, the pastimes and the descriptions of God given in the scriptures are suitable for the public, including children. But God is not limited to those. <laughs> God is wild. God is beyond all our limitations, all our imaginations, all our conceptions. So when God reveals the form to which we are related intimately, huh? It's always a surprise. It's always something extreme, something that you would never imagine, something that you would really hesitate to discuss with anybody <laughs> because it's so wild. It's so beyond all limits. See, and this is the highest platform of divine love. And when you develop this relationship with your Ishta Devata, then it goes beyond any other kind of relationship and it becomes the center of your life, especially your emotional life. You become completely dependent upon God to satisfy your emotional needs. And this is really the way that one becomes happy because nobody else is going to do that. Relationships with people are notoriously unreliable because people are, I mean, they can't keep their words. They can't keep their promises. They make a promise to get something that they want. And once they get it, they don't care what they said anymore. This is human nature. It's flawed. It's defective. It's unreliable. And so are the relationships between humans because of this. So, the only way to really achieve uh, emotional happiness is to have a relationship with God. See, and with that relationship, one can rise to the highest level of enlightenment, of spiritual life, 
realization of Brahman. <laughs> the water guys are here. I have to go see them. But I just wanted to give this to all of our viewers so that you can understand how to perfect your spiritual life and to take the actions that you need to really reach the pinnacle of love, which is the land of no sorrows. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.